Hello and welcome to the video on the Reformation. Well, the first video on the Reformation, this one's about the causes, the theology, and the major figures of that time period. So in SOL 3A, we will explain the effects of the theological, political, and economic differences that emerged during the Protestant Reformation by writing a historical narrative that knits together the many threaded perspectives from that time period. The big picture is that for centuries, the Roman Catholic Church had little competition in religious thought and action, but the resistance of the Church to change led to this Protestant Reformation thing, which resulted in the birth of new political and economic institutions. <clears throat> Remember we saw in the medieval mind documentary that the church was the framework of society, that since the end of the Roman Empire in 450, which is, remember, about a thousand years before the time period we're talking about, um, they had the most power of any single organization, far more powerful than kings even, because Henry IV of Germany at one point was excommunicated for various reasons, and rather than, you know, just sort of shrugging it off like King Henry VIII would do later, uh, he walks across the mountains in snow dressed as a penitent monk to ask for forgiveness from the Pope because he was going to be unseated as king. So the Pope had enough influence to knock kings down. It's a pretty big deal. And before the Protestant Reformation, anyone who spoke out against the church was pretty effectively killed. Jan Hus was a Czech, as in like Czechoslovakia, uh, in Eastern Europe, he was a Czech rebel inspirer, as in he was a, a theologian and thinker whose ideas help inspired Czech nationalism and also a sort of separate uh, set of ideas from the church, which resulted in some rebellions, which then the church absolutely crushed. Um, John Wycliffe was an English translator uh, and also an inspirer of a group called the Lollards who followed his ideas. But he was also persecuted and pretty effectively put down by the church. But then it changed. Uh, merchant wealth resulted in a new set of social structures. Because there was far more wealth coming into Europe and it could be more consistently used for things other than basic survival and the maintenance of militaries, uh, even persons within the church, especially in Rome, because right in Italy where that Renaissance uh, revitalization of the economic system in Europe, that rebirth of the economic system, um, resulted in even people in the church seeking really expensive ways to express themselves. Um, and this idea of usury, uh, usury was an old, that word right there, usury, uh, means lending money out for interest, which was forbidden by the church for a long time. So only people outside the church could do it, which is one of the reasons Jewish merchants became really powerful in Europe. So you could lend money, but you couldn't charge interest on it. So people found little ways around that, but because they found all these little ways around this rule, it became clear that usury as a rule for the church in any system didn't really make a lot of sense. So regionalism also, because the church was based in Italy, uh, but France wanted control over the church and Spain wanted control over the church and Germany wanted it. Basically anyone who was uh, under the thumb of the Pope, the political leaders there wanted to be able to control their own local church or control the whole church if possible. Then also, because the church was so powerful, the peasants on up to kings envied that power. Finally, the, the church was really corrupt during this time period. For instance, they would sell off the right to be a priest for a particular area and get income based on that, even though you had never lived there, had no intention of living there, and really weren't much of a priest. They would even create whole places that didn't exist and give people priesthoods of those areas and just pay them money, basically. But... The reason the church would do that is because in the short term, that a person would pay to get that position. So especially a, a father would pay to get his son that position. Finally, there's this guy over here, Johann Tetzel. And he was one of a whole group of uh, people in the Catholic Church who were selling what were called indulgences. Again, think back to that medieval mind documentary where there was that horrible place that that guy, uh, Turkill, imagined that he went when he had that near-death experience. And purgatory was one of the places that he visited. And he found his father there. And his father said, if you just say 10 masses for me, uh, then I'll be able to leave the purgatory. But he didn't mean say 10 masses and Turk will do it himself. He meant pay a priest to say 10 masses, like 10 religious services for me. And indulgences were you paying money to the church so that either you or especially your dead relatives could get out of this horrible, torturous purgatory place faster.
and even people at the time were like, hey, that seems wrong. So they got a little mad, a little miffed. Uh, also, I, I really like this. Hipster Johan Tetzel was charging money for salvation before Scientology was cool. Because Scientology is a religion that charges a lot of money for you to be a part of it today. So here's some major figures from that time period who actually helped make this happen. This break from the church, this new rebellion against the church that was actually successful, as opposed to Jan Hus and John Wycliffe, who were not successful. So Martin Luther is the main dude that you got to know. He was a German monk, and he saw Johann Tetzel selling those indulgences and got really mad about it and basically sought to reform the church, to fix the stuff that was wrong about the church. He had this idea that it wasn't good works that you were doing or your ability to pay money to the church that should result in you going to heaven. It was just by your faith, just by how strong your faith was. So he had this salvation by faith alone idea. He also started to reject the idea of the church as the ultimate authority on earth. These are the Bible, the actual writing of the, the Christian religion was the ultimate authority. But he came by this idea first, and then this became clear and clearer to him as the church opposed his every suggestion. And finally, he had the idea that all humans are equal before God in religious matters. At first, he sort of had this idea in general, but then he saw a bunch of peasant re revolts, um, where the peasants are like, yeah, we are equal. Let's take all the stuff from the nobility. And that made, uh, that made Martin Luther really nervous because he was being protected by the nobility from the church. So, yeah. Uh, so here are the actions that he took. When he got mad and he wanted to try and reform the church, what he did, just like anyone else who was a monk in this day and age would do if he had some issue to bring up, he walked up to a church. This is probably true. This is maybe just a story, but he came up with these 95 different ideas of how to reform the church, of these horrible things that they were doing. And he called them the 95 Theses. And he nailed them to a door. This is what you would do because people didn't have like TV. You would nail things to doors, just like putting up a, a, a sign. And to start a conversation was the goal. But instead it resulted in the church splitting permanently in half. Uh, and that was called the Protestant Reformation because you're protesting right? You're protesting the stuff the church is doing. And the church that he started was called the Protestant church in the big sense. Specifically, his one was called the Lutheran church later. Then there's this guy, Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII did not start a church because he had some really strong religious beliefs like Martin Luther. Um, instead, he was the king of England from 1509 to 1547. Um, and his idea was more that on the political side, the king, the local king should control the church, not the pope ways away. Um, this all comes from basically King Henry VIII needing a divorce. Because at first he was called the defender of the faith by the pope, but uh, Henry VIII really needed an heir, a male son uh, who would be able to take over the throne after he died. And his first wife was not getting him that son. It was mainly only having daughters or not having children. So what he did, he tried to get a divorce, which isn't that weird, like that would have been a big deal, except that the queen that he was trying to divorce was Spanish, and so was the pope. So the pope was not going to let that happen. So the king said, well, then I'm going to control the church. And he got a law passed in parliament, and he took over the English church and took all the lands and the wealth of that English church, which was a huge deal. This entire island area of England had just broken away from the Catholic Church, and one of the first places to break away effectively like that. Queen Elizabeth uh, I came along after King Henry VIII and actually like put some new rules and a new face on that church and became the Anglican Church, um, the Church of England. In the United States, it's called the Episcopal Church. And she put some new ideas in there and also reformed the way they did religious services and some other things like that. And one of the major results of her reign was more religious tolerance because she had to deal with the issue of Protestants and Catholics living in the same country and how it would be possible for them to live together productively. And she did a fairly good job of that. Um, she also expanded a lot of England's holdings in uh, places overseas and had a major naval victory over the Spanish, which pretty much resulted in the survival of the Protestant church in England. Because if the Spanish had won, they probably would have imposed Catholicism, at least in the short term. So John Calvin is the last of these theologians we're looking at. And he was French, but he's, really, he's known for being 
in Switzerland. So we think of him more as a Swiss guy because he was in control of Geneva as a dictator for a while. I'll get there in a second. So he had this very clear idea that you are born and God decides immediately whether or not you're going to heaven. That he knows when you're born. His whole idea was like, if you have this God who knows everything, how does he, he must know before you're even born whether or not you're going to heaven. And you could tell, as a human living on earth, you could tell who was going to go to heaven by people who would live righteously, especially in terms of their work ethic. They were working really hard. But if you saw them living that way, of course they were going to heaven. They must be. So they must be one of the ones predestined to go to heaven like that. And he expanded the Protestant movement and made it more secure. And especially his ideas spread really quickly um, because people liked the idea of, of being the elect and, oh, of course I'm going to heaven. So he was a dictator, by the way, of Geneva for a while. They, they invited him in and he was dictator and said no gambling and no dancing and no drinking and no uh, fornication and just lots of other things. And people got mad enough about not being able to dance and do those other things that they kicked him out. But the government after him was way worse in the other direction where it was like they were doing horrible things. So they invited him back and then he was dictator again for a while. Dictator is a harsh word. He kind of was. And so the church was challenged Rulers saw a chance for power, and Europe got way more violent 